Welcome to this edition of the Your Weekly Dose of Nonprofit Podcast, the podcast that delivers actionable items you can implement at your organization right away. I'm your host, Fryam Gopin of 1832 Communications. Today, I'm really happy to have with us one of the smartest nonprofit people I know, an expert in marketing, communications, and wordsmithing, my friend, Erica Mills Barnhart. Erica, how are you doing today? I'm actually, I'm fantastic. Excellent. Okay. Let's introduce you to our listeners, watchers, and readers. Erica is an associate teaching professor at the University of Washington's Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. In addition to teaching classes on nonprofit marketing, philanthropy, and social innovation, she co-directs the Nancy Bell Evans Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Erica is also the founder and CEO of Klaxon, a company that teaches those doing good how to get noticed. Her clients have included the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bellingham Food Bank, Group Health Foundation, King County Library System, and hundreds more. She is the author of Pitch Falls, Why Bad Pitches Happen to Good People, and the creator of The Wordifier, an online tool that lets nonprofits amplify their words. In today's episode, we're going to discuss the power of words. Let's dive right in. Erica, do words still have the same power they once did, given the current age of short text messages tweets, abbreviations, and emojis? Um, I, I would say they actually have more power. And I, I, I would say that, you know, there's this expression, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time, which in the United States, we attribute to, um, oh my gosh, Mark Twain. But actually, he was paraphrasing Blaise Pascal, just to set the record straight on that. But the idea is, it's actually, you know, short format is actually harder than longer format. Um, and this is, you know, when I teach the almost every class that I teach, I have my students do a 280 character, so same as, as Twitter, um, like their key takeaways for the week. And at first they're like, oh, that's great. It's only 280 characters. And I'm like, yeah, just wait for it, wait for it. And what I hear consistently is that was one of the hardest <laughs> Um, assignments I've ever had in, in because it forces parsimony, right? When you, when you have like a whole swath and you can say whatever and go on and on. In some ways that gives you the luxury of like, well, I didn't quite mean that. Let me true that up a little bit. Um, so I actually, I, I mean, to a certain extent, I would say more. Um, with specific regards to like emojis and sort of symbolism that we're bringing into language, there is a raging debate about this, um, as you can imagine, some you know pros and cons. You know, the job of language and the job of, uh, well, words are part of language. And if the job of language is to communicate, sometimes what we're communicating about is an emotion. And so in a lot of ways, emojis are really advancing us as, you know, in terms of language. Um, you know, I would just say, obviously, sometimes an emoji isn't appropriate. <laughs> you know, just like you're gonna calibrate your language for context, like I was just grading policy memos for my students. Um, and you know, a pretty standard piece of feedback I give us like, this is a, this sentence is just fine. Policy memos are pretty formal. Um, so you probably, you, you know, you want it to be a little more, you want to elevate it a little bit and have it be a bit more formal. Um, but assuming you're doing that and you're not like inappropriately sending emojis to people, I, I actually view it. One of the things I love about language and, and what keeps me hooked is that it is always evolving. And I find that exciting. Um, it frustrates a lot of people, but yeah, so it sort of depends on your philosophy about the, the role of language and what it can do. Excellent. There are organizations that use food insecurity instead of hunger or people with autism as opposed to autistic people. It's an argument over being direct with donors, say what you mean, or being more PC, more people first. Where do you stand on this issue in terms of messaging and fundraising? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Also, I have to say I'm facing my window and as you can tell, we're having like some sunshine and then not sunshine. So sorry, I, I end up looking a little ghost-like at times, but it's probably better than me hopping up and trying to adjust the blinds all the time. Um, so that's a really interesting question, but your examples are actually not apples to apples, right? It's an apple to an orange. So one with food, food insecurity is actually one of my all time biggest pet peeves. I'm like, you're talking about hunger, just say hunger. Like the food isn't insecure, you know, like the eggplant isn't sitting there like, oh, I'm having an existential crisis, I'm insecure. Like that's actually what that pairing says, that the food is insecure. The food's, not, the food's fine, you know, 
you are saying hunger. So in that instance, I'm in the camp of like, say that. With your second example, at least to me, that's a different thing, right? And this has to do with how we identify people and whether or not um, that that is by their context or not. So it's not just about being direct or not direct, right? So um, yeah, at least in the United States, you, you, you really saw an evolution and, and we, you know, your example with autism would be similar, but um, with, we used to refer to foster kids, you would hear, oh, they're a foster kid. Now you don't hear that quite as much. Um, and the reason for that is that the foster kids were like, I'm a kid and I happen to be in foster care right now, right? It's, it's a circumstance and it's, um, and don't, and don't define me by that, right? So, so I think with that, you know, when there are people involved, the question to ask is, do these people want to be defined in this way? And the only way you can find out is by asking them. Don't hypothesize. <laughs> you know, if you're not in that camp, right? Just ask um, and, and, you know, see what feels right to them. What is respectful? Um, yet yeah, still accurate. I mean, you don't want to go into weird euphemisms. Like food insecurity, what bugs me is that it's kind of this euphemism for hunger. Um, uh, but with those others, you know, you don't want to get into weird euphemisms, but also you want to be really respectful of how those people want to be referred to. to. So, yeah. So okay. it depends. My answer is it depends. Okay. Today's actionable item. You created an amazing tool called the Wordifier, which allows people to enter words and check how often it's used by other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Using the same words as everyone else won't help you stand out. Could you please tell us three to four words or phrases that many nonprofits use and what you would substitute in their place? Yeah, another great question. Um, and my answer to this one is also, it depends. So, so, so I'll just give a little bit of the, you know, some findings. So um, you have heard me harsh on the verb provide for a long time. And so the question I get, so, so the deal is provide is, the, depending on who slice and dice, the fourth or fifth most used a uh, verb by nonprofits, um, you know, it, it, it comes behind is and are and, you know, verbs of being and stuff like that. Um, so it's just not very interesting. And verbs are action words. So that's your way of saying, like, this is what we're creating in the world. So for nonprofits, this is, you know, verb, verbs are always important. Um, but for nonprofits, they're like really, really important. Provide is a very flexible word. You can provide anything to anybody, which is why it ends up there. But it's also just so boring. Uh, right, and I, you know, part of the idea of getting people engaged or interested, and then and then keeping them, but in you know, marketing sort of ends up being a, a bit more in the acquisition space as we're thinking about um, fundraising. Um, so you you want to be picking words that are going to activate someone's brain, and, and this is biochemical, right? So it's not um, we love novelty, our brains love novelty, so it's it's playing off of that research and that sort of fundamental truth about how our brains work. Um, but the thing is, I can't just say, well, well, you should swap that out for, you know, clearly you, you shouldn't say that provide, you should say this. That depends entirely on context. And when I say to organizations, once they get over their disappointment, that I'm like, I don't have your, I, I don't have the exact answer for that for you. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the work is like, what are you really trying to say? What is the change that you're creating in the world? And that's, those aren't easy answers. Right? So, so there's some work underneath that has to happen with that one. I will say though, one of the, the best things you can do is, you know, if you work for a nonprofit, go, go through all your marketing materials and your fundraising. And every time you see the verb provide, ask yourself, is there not a better verb? Um, because in general, sentence, in general, every once in a while there's an exception, but in general, if you see provide, um, there is a better written sentence to be had. There is. Uh, I would say another one that comes up a lot is the word community. Um, and this is a toughie because it's a little bit similar, but the thing with community is um, the, the attentiveness that you want to bring to that is like you may be, you may say community and you are like, well, clearly everybody's going to understand who, who community is for us, but especially if it isn't somebody who's involved in your organization um, yet, they're just getting to know you, they may not in fact know how you're defining community. Uh, and what I see oftentimes is organizations just like assuming that everybody defines community in the same way that, that, that they do. And that assumption is dangerous. Um, I mean, uh, you know, assumptions are on a continuum of like danger to like, oh, that's a bummer. We didn't, you know, define that as clear as we could have. But it becomes dangerous early on um, when somebody's getting to know you because they can feel excluded. 
right? It is similar to the use of the word we. So this is another red flag word. In acquisition, in, in particular, if, if, if it's an acquisition missive um, in fundraising, unless somebody has already given to you, they are not part of the we. And oftentimes you'll see letters, you, you, I mean, you've seen this, right? Many, many times I'm sure we're, we're, we're the we, the, the writer, the organization says we, and they're like, oh, they're gonna feel a part of this. But on the receiving end, they're like, I'm not, I'm not a part of you yet. You know, I haven't given, I haven't volunteered, I haven't done these things. And so it actually creates distance when what you're trying to do is bring somebody in, it actually does the opposite. It creates distance. It makes them feel even further away um, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of engagement. So those are three. Fantastic. But anybody can go, if you're curious about any word, go wordofire.com, it's free. And you can, I mean, that's why I made it free, right? <laughs> it's so that, it, so that as you're sitting there, uh, you, you can have a way to go and know definitively how often a word is being used. It also breaks down by subsector, which is helpful because, you know, if you're in arts and you use the word ballet, that's different than the environment. Like not a lot of folks are using the word ballet in the environment. So it's, you know, language is always contextual. Yes, those were three excellent examples. Well, uh, thank you. At your company, Klaxon, you help organizations use the right words so they go from being the best kept secret in town to world famous. A, why is the company named Klaxon? And B, what's involved in that work as far as messaging that engages more people and then helps raise more money? Yeah, um, okay, so I have a prop for this. That, like, I'm trying to get a spot so that people aren't like, what is happening? Um, if for those who don't know, this is a Klaxon horn. You may have seen it. I won't do that because that's really blary and annoying, but this is a Klaxon horn. Um, <clears throat> I wanted it to be one word and I wanted it to be a different word, you know, in keeping with, with the idea. So, so the idea that, you know, we teach those doing good how to get noticed sort of fundamentally, we do that by using words predominantly. Um, you know, to me, the, the horn and the klaxon horn, you know, if you haven't heard it, go, go and listen. Um, it's a very distinct sound. Um, I also wanted a word that could be said in multiple languages. Um, and so klaxon in French is klaxon, um, and also you can say it in Spanish, you can, so it like, it can be, um, it can be said in a lot of languages, which was important to me as well. So that's the backstory on it, it sort of epitomized uh, the point of doing the work. Um, and then the second, or your second question is, I think the mechanics of like, how does klaxon work with clients? I think that's what you're getting at. Yep. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways. Um, when when we do client engagements, they tend, um, my joke is that I start off and I want them to be uh, democratic at the beginning and draconian at the end. <laughs> and the reason I say that is it, it bums me out how nervous organizations are to ask a wide variety of stakeholders to word I don't like, right? But, you know, let's people who care as deeply about the mission, including the people that the organization is serving. Right, and so the work of coming up with with words that are going to resonate is to know what words are going to resonate, and behind that is like what do, what do folks care about? Um, so you have to ask. That's the only way to do it. So in general, I'm going to start with a survey. For the most part, they are online surveys. Every once in a while, you know, depending on the on the community, um, you know, if there are folks that aren't going to be able to respond online, we'll look at other mechanisms. But in general, we're going to start with a with a fairly fun online survey that asks about adjectives and verbs and nouns and those types of things. And, and, and I'm looking for a couple of things there. One is just, um, you know, what, what words are people actually using to reflect back in terms of the questions. Also, I'm looking for like how far apart are things or how in alignment are they already? Cause that's really actionable information. And then from there uh, in general, I'm going to work with a, a, you know, five to seven person team. Um, uh, to evolve and refine the language, you know, we're going to find vision in general, vision and or purpose, um, values, brand personality, and then all of that is going to roll into a messaging framework. Um, and then oftentimes um, out of that, there's, you know, I'll help with like website copy or sort of bring it to life is how I think about that phase of it. Um, but that really gets to, you know, there, you want a transition to happen. The words aren't mine. I'm a consultant, right? So I'm going to come in and I'm going to, you know, I can sh shepherd and facilitate, but ultimately if the, or the, the organization needs to like feel like those are their words. And so I make a very intentional transition 
near the end um, to like uh, transition into more of a coaching role or an advisory capacity um, so that so that that um, sense of ownership happens because otherwise if you don't bring great intentionality to that step you remain dependent, you can remain dependent on, on your consultant. And that's not all bad. And, you know, a lot of consultants that said their businesses um, are, are organized on purpose. I just have a different philosophy, right? Like, I believe all of this is learnable. Um, I know it's all learnable because I've worked with thousands of people. Um, nothing I do is rocket science. It's just a matter of being at a place where you're ready to learn it. So if I do my job, um, they don't contact me very much or, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking to an organization tomorrow um, that I worked with a few years ago and things have evolved for them internally. And so now we need to true up, you know, how they're talking about that externally. So that makes sense, you know, because outside perspective is helpful, but it's, that's generally the, the mechanics of it. Yeah. And then we also have, I'm just mindful that, I mean, the vast majority of nonprofits can't afford consulting. Um, and so I also have a online school called Clax and You. Um, we have an online self-paced online course, um, the complete nonprofit marketing course. So that's another way for folks at a much lower price point, $249, um, for folks to learn and really go through the exact same process I do with um, with my consulting clients and, and to access that same knowledge. Yeah. In one of my previous podcast episodes, nonprofit copywriter Mike Dorkson advocated for the killing of the mission statement or at least moving away from the vague, run on sentence, undefined ones. I followed that up with a blog post where I issued the tuition challenge, write your mission statement in 140 characters or less. In one of your recent Marketing for Good podcast episodes, you mentioned that you only allow clients to have 10 words in their mission statement. My question, what is it about mission statements that causes nonprofits to go on and on and on? Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful question, and the reason I say beautiful is the the run on mission statement um, comes from a really beautiful place, which is oftentimes like if you're not really following a a vetted process, what have most mission statements are written by an internal committee, a board, maybe some staff, but, um, <clears throat> but, but and so it sort of ends up being written for them. People who serve on boards and work for nonprofits, as you will know, like this is heart driven work, right? So they care very deeply about it. And what, what happens so frequently is people want to see a little bit of themselves in the mission statement, right? So it's actually a very emotional reason um, and not a real strategic reason for these long run on mission statements that have like semicolons. Um, really? Uh, so I mean, that's just in my experience, that's how you end up is like every, everybody, so everybody wants to see a piece of themselves. Um, prioritizing doesn't feel good, right? Because if you say, yeah, you know, in our mission statement, this is the thing that we're really going to point to. This is what we want to be known for. If, if you don't see yourself in that, if you don't see your program, if you don't see your service, you feel excluded and you feel left out. Right. And so, again, this is why I care so much about the education side of it is, in my experience, when you explain to folks like a, a really good mission statement is the same as you know, if somebody says, you know, what does your nonprofit do, you're going to be able to say the mission statement and not in a way where you sound like a robot. Right. And then it's meant to be a deal, you know, a door opener, not a deal closer. Right. And so what I say to folks is this is this is a this is a sequencing. And if somebody is interested in what you just said, then they're gonna be like, oh, that's interesting. And then, then we'll get to your part of it, your specific part of it. But if you like dump it all on them, they're like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't remember that. I, I don't even know what you just said, it's too much. So in my experience, that's where it comes from. You know, the eight to 10 words is very much, I am um, one of the sort of somewhat unusual um, things about my philosophy is I wanna optimize first for how you speak and then we can elevate that language. But if we actually, and for the most part, that's very unusual to say that, um, for the most part, folks write a mission statement and then they say it. And um, in my book, Pitch Falls, I talk about this, you know, it's an itty bitty book. It's a seven minute read. It's a, you know, it's a book. Um, and I did that on purpose to, that made it short and accessible in that way, uh, really to address this issue. Um, because it's it's pervasive, bad mission statements are pervasive. I mean, I wrote that Stanford Social Innovation Review article now a number of years ago, um, but I just, for a variety of reasons, had to reread it. And I was like, yeah, nope, I still stand by 
stand behind all of this. Uh, and, and specifically, it's called um, Great Mission, Bad Statement. Uh, and that's, you know, it's all about this. Yeah, it's a bummer. Totally agree, 100%. Let's move on to the lightning round and learn more about you. What okay. started on your nonprofit career path? I don't really know how that happened. I, I don't, I mean, I think I've always kind of been somebody who was drawn to doing good. Um, I finished graduate school and I was looking around and, you know, I was, I was in Seattle. I still am in Seattle. And there was a very innovative organization, nonprofit called Empower. Um, we put technology know-how into the hands of nonprofits and this was way back when. Um, they were just really innovative and I wanted to do something interesting and innovative in the social good space. Um, and that kind of set, set me on my, set me on my path. Got it. So given all your years of experience in the nonprofit field, if there's one thing you could shake up in the nonprofit world, what would it be? It troubles me very deeply that depending on which organizations you're looking at, 80 to 90% of all the leaders are white. Um, and yet uh, that's disproportionately we're serving communities of color. And so the fact that they are not represented troubles me very, very deeply. Yeah, uh, so, so that, that would absolutely, um, that has to change. I mean, it, it, that just has to change. Yep. Uh, where does your obsession with words come from? <laughs> um, I, 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 two things. I moved from Vancouver, Canada down to the greater Seattle area uh, in between the summer of grade two and grade three. I could only read and write French. I spoke English, but I could only read and write French. So over the summer, I had to learn how to read and write English. Um, and I think that that would be like learning it with that amount of like clarity about like, that was gonna make me really unusual and I was not gonna fit in. I was already new. I wasn't really gonna fit in if I couldn't read or write. Um, made me have a relationship uh, with, with words, especially the English language. And then I, you know, majored in French and I've um, spent time in France and, you know, everything they say about the French and their obsession with words is true. <laughs> and so there is that like sort of being exposed to that culturally um, I'm sure had an influence as well. Fantastic. If you could live somewhere else besides the Pacific Northwest, where would it be? <sighs> tough. That's really tough. Um, I don't have one place. I really don't. I mean, I do, I, I love, I love France. Um, so, you know, maybe some, the first time I lived there, I lived in Caen, which is in the North. Um, I'd love to go back there and spend time, but there's just, you know, there's so many places on the planet that I haven't been. So it's, it's hard for me to commit to like, I would live anywhere else. I would like to visit a lot of other places and like spend a chunk of time. How's that? Now we're talking. Your favorite hobby in your spare time? Cooking and working out. <laughs> At the same time? What? At the same time? Because that's impressive. That would no. Be Excellent clarifying question. No, no, there's the working out generally happens in the morning, the cooking generally happens uh, in the evening. Yeah, and I, it's not like I'm a fabulous cook or anything. I just, I find it really almost meditative to mess with food. That's what I think about it. It's like messing with food at the end of the day. You can create something, it's creative. And then I've always worked out. I just, I enjoy it. I, I just got like um, resistance bands, like different. And I, you know, I have weights, a full weight set. So the resistance bands are like a new thing for me. And I'm kind of excited about that. And I don't know, you know, both of them, they're creative for me, so. And relatively healthy. So. Awesome. Lastly, let's turn the table. You get to ask me one surprise question. I have no idea what's coming. Go ahead. You, um, you have a unique perspective because you've lived in the States and clearly now live in Israel. Um, I'm curious, what is the biggest similarity and difference that you see between nonprofits in those two places? Uh, similarities are all the um, ills that plague the nonprofit world in the US, plague them here, plague them everywhere. Uh, I, you know, the, the idea of scarcity mindset, the idea of everything being about the money, not being about the relationships, the idea of constantly chasing your tail, the bad retention rates, um, all the issues, all the issues uh, that you have in the States. And again, I'm generalizing, but all the issues that you have in the States, you have here, not even a question. Um, <clears throat> the one major difference that I came in contact with yeah. is the issue of uh, working on a percentage. Whereas, oh. yeah, so in the States, you know, AFP is very clear about that with their ethics and, you know, <clears throat> it's something fundraisers should not do. There is yeah. no um, 
AFP type organization here and for, for forever. Organizations, many organizations have been working on uh, percentage. Is it less today? Yes, but I was offered 10 years ago. And I mean, the offer on the table was 49% plus expenses of whatever I raised. Yeah, and you know what? You start thinking seven figures, if you can bring in a million dollars and 600,000 is going into your pocket, you know, you start weighing things and you go, oh, you know, I could use a new house. We could upgrade the car. Maybe the kids can now go to, you know, all the things that you think about with money, that is still, I don't wanna say pervasive here, but there is still plenty of that when it comes to grant writing, when it comes to uh, fundraising. And my answer, I get it every now and then, and I just look at them and go, you know what? Like you, I have to put bread on the table. And the only way for me to do that is to know exactly what my salary is gonna be, or you know what my consulting fee is gonna be, and pay me. I will happily get you a million dollars, even if the only cost to you is $10,000. That's fine. I'm not yeah. gonna ask for more, but I won't work for free. And that has been, that's the, I would say the major difference. There are a couple more, but that's the major one. Uh, that, that is fascinating. Yeah. So that's, I, I, whatever, I, I, some of it is cultural. Some of it is, again, there's no AFP here. Um, there's no over, um, there's no umbrella organization. Yeah. They tried to start AFP here a bunch of years ago. It didn't take. Um, in fact, I think the closest chapter to me is in Egypt. That's what I found out a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just the culture here and not much we can do about it. So anybody who asks me, I'm like, I'm not doing it. It's unethical. And here are all the reasons why it's problematic for you and your organization. You want to find somebody else? Go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. I love that though, because it's you living in integrity with your values, regardless of, of an organization or another entity, an outside entity saying that that's how you should roll. Yeah, although, like I said, that uh, that one offer really, really thought about it for a whole second there, because it is, you know, it was an it would have been sixty percent I would have taken home. So, um, but yeah, wow is the word because it was an the truth is, as an organization, I could have gotten six to seven figures for without a problem, and that was the other thing. Yeah. About it. This was not a tough sell. You know, some organizations it's a very tough sell. This was yeah. a much easier sell than others. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Gulp thought about it, said, nope, and whatever. I'm not, I don't regret it for even a second. Good. Good for you for living your values. That's, uh, that's great. It's awesome. Uh, it's awesome. Thank you very much for appearing on the podcast today. You oh, thanks for having me. with Erica on LinkedIn and on Twitter at Erica Mills Barn. You definitely want to make sure to check out her marketing for good podcast on her website is the link. You can find it at klaxonmarketing.com slash marketing for good. Erica, thanks very, very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. It's great to see you. Be well. Take care.